Hi, good afternoon. My name is GP. Uh, I'm with Stack Armor. I will be your host uh, for our ATO Acceleration Workshop. Uh, welcome to all of our attendees and listeners uh, to this session. For those of you that are on the West Coast or other, coast, uh, other coasts, um, good morning. Uh, we have a great cast of speakers today. And if you're an organization that's interested in uh, or has heard about FedRAMP, uh, ATOs, and are in the business of providing cloud services, commercial cloud services to government organizations and have been sort of scratching your head and trying to figure out um, how you might go in and uh, essentially do business with the federal agencies uh, or what FedRAMP is all about. Uh, or how you might go in and get an ATO, then this is definitely the right place for you to show up. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, interest around uh, essentially compliance, security, and cloud. And those are all the fun topics that we will be talking to you about today. Uh, again, welcome. Um, I'm your host, uh, GP. I'm the CEO and founder of Stack Armor. And with me, I have an amazing, amazing cast of super experienced speakers uh, that have spent many, many years, if not decades, uh, in the area of compliance, security, government, FedRAMP, NIST, FISMA, all of the uh, alphabet soup that you might or might not want to become familiar with. Uh, but we do have an amazing cast of speakers and topics. And so what we will be doing today is helping you better understand uh, what an ATO is, the different types of ATOs, and how you might go in and start preparing your organization and also understanding the expectations that an organization has when they go through this process. So with that, um, I will go in and launch into a brief introduction uh, on some of the folks that you will encounter today during this session. And I hope that you find this uh, very interactive. Please ask us questions. And please make yourself familiar with the Zoom software that allows us to go in and uh, submit your, uh, answer your questions. So please use the uh, Q&A feature on your Zoom panel to go in and ask questions. We will have a moderator here uh, reviewing those questions, reading them out, um, addressing the panel. We will try and make sure time permitting that we get all of the answers. And if not, then we will try answers um, after the session. Uh, if you're having any technical difficulties, if you have any questions, uh, please do send us an email and we will try and make sure that we're able to go and respond to you in a timely manner. Again, welcome. And I hope you find the ATO Acceleration Workshop useful in your efforts in better understanding FedRAMP, the ATO process, and what might be involved in pursuing such an endeavor. So just really quickly, uh, introducing you to Stack Armor. We are based in the Washington DC metro area, and we basically help commercial and federal organizations through the whole life cycle of compliance, which typically we call an operator TO. Uh, again, we are a services and consulting organization. So we are able to go in and offer different kinds of services that are custom and tailored to an organization's requirement. For example, you might be a startup uh, in the Bay Area providing healthcare SaaS solutions and are interested in doing business with uh, the Veterans Affairs Administration. Uh, we can help you understand and review your architecture, which we'll talk a little bit about today, uh, as well as help assess uh, the quality of your documentation and help you then uh, connect up with uh, amazing partners like FITS, who is a 3PAO, who is also on this presentation with us. Uh, we also offer other services around, for example, penetration testing, 
uh, cybersecurity vulnerability assessments, anything that you can imagine that you might need in terms of traversing your FedRAMP or ATO journey, we have a solution for that. And again, uh, we've done this for many, many years, uh, both for federal DOD uh, and again, um, uh, uh, high security requirement type systems in government and commercial environments. Typically, the way we engage with our customers is we bring in a lot of experience ahead of time where any kind of question that you can imagine around uh, an ATO or FedRAMP, we've probably heard it and we have dealt with it. But here are some top concerns that we find organizations face, especially startups uh, and even larger organizations that are uh, trying to get an ATO and do business with a federal agency. And typically they center around, you know, what kind of a region do I need to host in? Um, so Amazon, for example, comes in two uh, primary regions, East, West commercial or GovCloud. What's the right environment for me? Um, what kind of uh, ATO should I pursue? Uh, I've heard about low, moderate or high, uh, but what about DOD? So we again help you parse through those questions and come to the right conclusion that's custom tailored for your specific requirement. Uh, FIPS, FIPS encryption and compliance is a big deal and this is, uh, becomes a showstopper for a lot of organizations. So we basically help you identify these issues upfront so that you can then go in and implement remediation or use a solution that we might have already found in a similar situation. Uh, there are different paths which some of my colleagues will talk to you about and so which is the right one for you. Um, and another big question that comes up is how many people will it take? How much money will it cost? What are the kinds of services I can go in and add? So I, everything you can imagine from a uh, concern standpoint that comes up, we've addressed. And so that's where again, our ATO acceleration solution um, basically provides you with answers through these questions that you might face. The way we deliver our service, and some of my colleagues will talk to you about this, is we have an agile ATO approach where within a period of uh, about eight weeks, we are able to execute six sprints to give you essentially into an ATO ready state, which includes having a FedRAMP uh, landing zone, a NIST compliant security system, uh, and all of the orchestration around that uh, on AWS and AWS GovCloud to get you through that uh, readiness factor and including being able to put together the documentation, the control descriptions, uh, as well as hardening your environment, for example, using things like CIS benchmarks. So again, everything that you can imagine when you're orchestrating the engineering aspects of your ATO process we have orchestrated those and created um, sprints for those along with playbooks to make sure that we're able to orchestrate this in a timely fashion. Uh, we will be covering this and many other topics today. And I hope that you find these sessions useful in helping you understand the FedRAM program, what it takes to go through an ATO and how you might prepare. With that, I will introduce my colleague uh, Nalini to talk a little bit about FITS, who is really an amazing partner and a co-host of this show. Hello, everybody. Hope you're doing well. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And thank you, Stack Armor, for hosting this, this wonderful event, hoping that it's going to help a lot of you maybe raise some additional questions, but we all are here to help answer those questions. Um, just a you know, brief overview of my organization, First Information Technology Services. Uh, we abbreviate it as FITS, um, is uh, an organization that's been in the cybersecurity space for over 20 years now. Um, and we are, we also like to call ourselves kind of a full service um, organization. Uh, we help plan, you know, we help kind of figure out what your gaps are to the compliance that you're trying to achieve, then finally achieve it and maintain it. Um, and so, but this space is so dense and there's so many people in it. We play, end up playing very well with organizations like Stack Armor um, and complement each other in this space. Um, we have a strong track record. Uh, we have two 
independent teams that work directly either with the federal government or with commercial organizations. Um, in the federal space, we work directly with um, agencies, um, helping them build and maintain their security and compliance programs. Um, we're also a 3PAO, which is a third party assessing organization, which is specific to FedRAMP. Uh, and we're also in the process of becoming a C3PAO, uh, which is um, an upcoming designation uh, for folks who can do the credit, uh, the uh, assessment for CMMC, and that's something we're going to touch on as well today. Um, so we're here uh, and happy to answer any questions and to support the Stack Armor team. Thank you, GP. Thanks a lot, uh, Nalini, for that introduction. And with that, I will get out of your way and turn it over to my colleague, Travis, from FITS to talk to you about the different types of ATOs. Good morning, everybody. All right, and uh, GP, if you can confirm you're seeing seeing things the way they ought to be seen. Travis, I can see you loud and clear and brilliantly. Very good, thank you. <laughs> All right, well, um, what I hope to talk to you about today is just the types of authorization you might pursue and helping you figure out which one is appropriate for you. So 10 minutes is um, not a lot of time to teach you everything I know about all of these different, uh, different frameworks, but I think we can pack a lot in here. So <clears throat> moving on to the FISMA family tree. So um, certainly there are a lot of ancestors and a lot of cousins to these frameworks, but this is kind of how I see the landscape of the federal frameworks, the ones that you might be considering. So starting at the top, you have FISMA, which is a law and not exactly a framework in and of itself, but it did kick off quite a few um, different frameworks that you might encounter. So going down the list very quickly, um, you know, you have the the uh, NIST 853, the risk management framework that underlies everything that the, the feds do for themselves. And then you move on to FedRAMP, um, the DOD's implementations with the DOD RMF, their uh, cloud SRG and CMMC. So, and then of course you have some other things off to the side, you know, the Intel community has CNSSI 1253 and the CSF for, uh, for industry. So the ones that I have checked there are the ones we're gonna spend a little time on today. And I think the main thing I wanted to convey with this map is that as, as you're considering these, if you're trying to decide between FedRAMP or CMMC, or if you have a FISMA authorization and you're worried about RMF, these are all very closely related because they all kind of share common ancestry. And so the controls are gonna look very familiar and there's going to be mapping between all of these. So. Taking a look at FISMA, so FISMA and NIST 853, the, the standard civilian agency RMF, is what the feds are doing for their own information systems. So you might encounter these you know, on premise within the agency itself. So field offices, agency headquarters, agency run data centers, or occasionally you might see uh, off premise enclaves at contractor sites, partner agencies. That's by no means a comprehensive list, but these are some places you might might see the, the feds taking on the, uh, the FISMA authorization themselves. So here you have a single agency owner. Um, systems that are deployed can't be reused by other agencies. Um, if another agency wanted a similar system, they would have to go through the whole authorization process themselves. <clears throat> and for each FISMA authorization, it's really the agency authorizing official that by law under FISMA makes the rules. And it's highly encouraged there's um, a tailoring process that, that, that happens and the uh, agency authorizing official, often the CIO, you know, usually with the involvement of the CISO, releases policies to, to implement all of that. Um, and here you also have a little bit of a different take on independence. Certainly there's a lot of different ways this can happen across the many different agencies, but the assessment function is generally in-house or with a contractor that answers to the CISO or somebody internal to that agency. So there's not necessarily an independent um, 
a sensor that comes out. And you move on to FedRAMP. <clears throat> so once the feds looked around and realized that they were putting many of their uh, many of their systems out into the world and that they saw the, the cloud landscape shifting, um, they realized that all of these vendors were not following those federal standards that, that FISMA required. So the FedRAMP program was born to create a marketplace of cloud products that have been vetted to those federal information security standards. So the idea there being that you audit once and use many times. Um, it was very quickly evident that if uh, a major cloud service, even a minor cloud service, wanted to um, have multiple federal customers, they could quickly spend all year going through audits with various um, audit teams coming out at all times. So one standard for auditing, um, allowing federal authorizing officials to evaluate one package that's created each year and then they can make their own decisions. Um, other key things here, you know, FedRAMP only applies to cloud products and it is a marketplace. So ultimately, the decision to pursue FedRAMP is a marketing decision. It's something you should do if there's a, a good return on investment if you have a strategy that you're pursuing. So very quickly, taking a look at the types of FedRAMP authorizations, um, we get a lot of questions about FedRAMP Ready. Should I be doing FedRAMP Ready? Well, FedRAMP Ready is a good interim step. It was created by the FedRAMP program as a way for you to decide whether or not the larger investment would be a good, a good step. There's a chicken and egg problem of I need a sponsor to know whether or not I should go for the full authorization package, but there are you know, challenges there. So it's a lightweight process. It gets you a one year listing as FedRAMP Ready in that FedRAMP marketplace. And, um, you know, assuming you, you pass through that, then it lets your potential sponsors know that you're a good bet for success and that they should move forward with confidence. So an agency authorization, this is essentially under the auspices of, of FISMA, an authorizing official decides to sign on the dotted line and um, place their information in your system. That, then if that authorization met uh, FedRAMP standards, FedRAMP, the FedRAMP program would put you on, on the marketplace then allowing you to advertise that and pursue additional agency, agency customers. And for some strategic, uh, often large scale um, products, the authorization board, the joint authorization board, I'll go back a slide for just a moment. Um, that's the GSA, Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Defense. The CIOs from each of those agencies can weigh in on your product and they issue a provisional authorization it's provisional because they don't have any power, again, getting back to that FISMA law, to tell other agencies whether they can or cannot or should or should not put their information in a cloud product, but they can give their advice. And so um, that is what they do. And it usually signals a, a high degree of confidence in the product because you can imagine going through three sets of reviewers as opposed to one set of reviewers. It adds a lot of, um, let's say bureaucracy to it, but by the end of the day, you've satisfied everyone's concerns, then uh, you have a product that everybody should be pretty confident in. All right, moving on here. The DoD RMF and also including the, the cloud SRG. So the RMF is DoD's implementation of the FISMA process. Um, and you remember the AO makes the rules. So that's no different for DoD. They maybe more than any other agency, have a lot of things that they want in their process. And so the DOD has issued the Cloud Security Requirements Guide for applying the RMF to cloud products. And internal to the DOD, they also have their own marketplace of approved products that DOD offices and branches can, can uh, purchase from. And lastly, you have CMMC. So you, this is the uh, Defense Acquisition uh, Regulations 800-171. This is, uh, you know, there's a goal to have everybody compliant with that by 2025. And I think we'll start seeing milestones come out across those years as well. It's not going to be the thing, the kind of thing where you can put it off entirely till 2025, I imagine. So main main things here to point out: um, there will be a C3 PAO. Um, you know, I didn't want to get into a uh, Star Wars copyright there, but there's the obvious joke that people make. Um, but 
that will be an independent verification. So this is a list of third party accrediting um, organizations or auditing organizations, however they uh, abbreviate it. And um, they will come out and do an independent assessment of your system and issue a report. A key thing here is it's not just the cloud, it's anywhere where you're processing federal contract information or other controlled unclassified information um, that can follow into your corporate networks, which is different than the other, the other frameworks we just talked about. So if you're processing you know, procurement data or other data that the feds consider to be controlled, they will want your other environment to uh, be considered under CMMC. And then we get a lot of questions around FedRAMP reciprocity. Getting back to that original map that I put out there, that family tree, 800-171 and its follow-on 800-172 are based on 853 controls. So the, the language is going to be very similar. There's a very close mapping. For your cloud environment, I imagine there will be some level of reciprocity. Or at, at a minimum, you won't have to go back and rework everything. It'll be a much lighter lift. However, again, it's that additional scope that, um, you know, if, if you are going to need a gap analysis or an audit of your corporate environment or other environments that you don't have FedRAMP authorized, uh, that could be something to be aware of. And just to wrap it up, uh, which one is it that you need? Um, FISMA, if your product is non-cloud, operated exactly for one agency. Um, RMF, if you're, if you're doing it for DOD. FedRAMP is a marketing decision if you're going to try and sell to more than one, one agency customer. And then the cloud SRG if, you're, if the DOD is one of those agency customers. And then CMMC if you're processing any federal contract information or controlled unclassified information. And I see that I hit 10 minutes just about exactly, but if we have time for questions, let me see if there are any in the, in the channel here. Trevor, thank you so very much for this. This is GP again. Um, amazing session and you know again these are some of the top questions that keep happening around you know what kind of an ATU do I need but we do have a question from one of our um, audience members and the question I'll para paraphrase it is um, do you have any thoughts on can you shed any light on the new DOD interim rule uh, related to CMMC and DFARS 7012? Yeah, and this is sort of where I got that comment about the interim milestone. Um, I was just looking that over this morning, so I haven't developed a strong opinion about it, but it does look like, um, if, if that's the one I'm remembering correctly, um, requiring some, um, basically that you, if you're currently processing DOD information, they want to see where they're at, and they want to have you run a gap analysis, so this is a self-assessment, and then any gaps you have, they want to assign a score to it so that they can measure where they're at. So. I'll say that I haven't read that exactly myself, so I don't want to go too much farther out on a limb until I've uh, done a little bit better research. But just to recap that, it looks like there is a, a self-assessment and uh, some scoring that's going to happen. And I'm not exactly sure what kind of decisions the DOD would be making once they receive those scores. Yep, that thank you. Yep, no, thank you. Thank you, Trevor. Yes, um, so real quickly from a uh, Stack Armor perspective, um, you know, there are lots of questions about 800, 171 and CMMC. So really I will uh, just echo what um, I think Trevor alluded to. So again, we've been operating in this space for a while. And so really this interim guidance suggests um, that you need to go in and complete your 800-171 obligations. Um, and again, as Trevor mentioned, complete your self-scoring and load up um, your assessment report in the WAF system such that it can be then um, evaluated for compliance. Uh, basically, it's another step in 800-171, which is sort of an interim step before um, CMMC kicks in with you know, all the different um, elements and pieces that Nalini, for example, talked about the C3PO um, as that program rolls out. So again, you know, as you can imagine, and I'm sure Trevor and Nalini, you're facing a lot of these questions, you know, uh, CMC, CMMC, what is it? You know, how much does it cost? Um, so all, all of those questions are great. And I think there'll be more to come on that as this program evolves. Um, Trevor, again, thank you so much for your session. And we will definitely go in um, and uh, get more questions as we get them. Uh, with that, I would like to um, invite my colleague, Martin Rieger from Stack Armor to talk to you a little bit about 
um, the next set of topics around this ATO workshop, um, especially around assessments and architecture. All right, thank you so much. Can everyone see the screen okay? You're yes. good, Martin. Okay, and thanks again, Travis, for that overview. All right, so moving into our next section, we're going to talk a little bit about um, an architecture assessment, including things like taking a look at the overall architecture, um, the security stack, and, and what the expectations are there, boundary protection, uh, network access, authentication, and some of the show-stopping items, uh, what data sensitivity means and how that applies to the categorization of your system, and uh, continuous monitoring. Um, there's a couple additional extra sections in here that address BIPs 199, which is how risk categorization is performed from a low, moderate, high standpoint. And then just, just a, a little bit of a touch on encryption. Um, so kind of first and, and foremost, you know, Travis mentioned uh, NIST 853. Um, that, is, that is a special publication with security controls. and. Um, one of the reasons I added this uh, particular slide is because whether you're doing FISMA or RMF or FedRAMP or DOD SRG, um, cloud or not, you, you've got, uh, for all intents and purposes, the, the same requirements in place in terms of access management and connecting to systems over VPNs, boundary protection, um, you, you know, in, in terms of firewalls, uh, leveraging tools like multi-factor uh, for identification authentication, um, implementing centralized logging, along with things like patch management, antivirus, uh, and of course, everyone's favorite vulnerability scanning. Um, but ultimately, you, you know, the, these 17 items that are kind of listed here are certainly not limited, but they are uh, across each compliance framework, even when you dip outside of NIST, um, and you start getting into uh, other components, um, this, this type of security architecture will satisfy uh, a lot of compliance requirements across the board. And so we're gonna start kind of dipping into those a little bit. So, you know, when taking a look at architecture, one of the first things we looked at is boundary protection. And we understand um, that creating systems, creating software and an environment is a lot like constructing a building, right? So the foundation, you know, if it's not solid, you can run into structural problems that can undermine the integrity of the entire building, or in this case, our federal information system. So, um, you know, when we talk about how is the data protected from the edge and what type of boundary protections are in place, uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, you know, we, we look at the firewalls, we look at VPN, we look at encryption, we look at uh, the certificates and PKI and, and what type of uh, boundary protections have you put in place to protect that environment? Um, the next kind of critical component there is network access, right? Uh, so how do your users um, access the environment? Uh, how do privileged users access the environment? And you know, you're probably starting to see a reoccurring theme here. What about the VPN? So, you know, from a privileged user aspect, being the individuals behind the scenes, pulling the strings, administering the environment, uh, performing, you know, all those critical activities that keep the system operational to your end users, right? Who are, for all intents and purposes, hitting the front end. Um, what can they do? What can they not do? And, and how do they get in there? From an authentication standpoint, you know, one of the first things that's expected and that we look for is, is, is there centralized authentication? How do you perform account management, right? Do, do you have um, the ability to monitor and log for significant events such as repeated failed logon attempts? Maybe it's, maybe the attempts are happening within five milliseconds of each other, not five seconds, but five milliseconds in attempts where somebody may be uh, performing something like a brute force attack or, um, you know, something like a rainbow attack where they're, they're coming after the environment with either known uh, usernames and attempting to break in. Um, from a multi-factor standpoint, right, are you using 
MFA. And, and that would be something you know, or something you are and something you have, any combination of these two items. Uh, in most cases, it's one and three. Um, if we use Okta or RSA tokens as an example, right? You have a username and password, and then you have a third item such as a token, maybe Duo or something like that, where you can connect from your phone and say, yes, that's me. Um, in terms of data sensitivity, you know, uh, we're talking about what is the sensitivity level of the data and, it, and it's captured in, in basically three categories. It's either going to be low, moderate or high risk data. Um, within the Department of Defense, there, there are other levels of FedRAMP and things like that. Um, but for all intents and purposes, uh, these are the three categories across FISMA, across the risk management framework and across FedRAMP. Um, so with that, is data encrypted? Uh, is, is the encryption uh, applied both when data is at rest uh, and or data is in motion, right? In and out of that boundary we, we talked about a moment ago. Um, FIPS 140-2, which I will uh, elaborate on for those that aren't familiar, um, is a federal information processing compliance for encryption that is authorized to be used in federal information systems. So uh, the rule of thumb is if you're going to encrypt within a federal system, it must be FIPS. And so, you know, we look to understand what encryption are you using? Is it compliant? And can we validate? Um, from a data retention standpoint, uh, when we start talking about things like contingency planning, backup and recovery or disaster recovery, you know, what are the data retention requirements um, for your customers and your system? And, and what do the recovery time objectives or recovery point objectives, in other words, how far back do you go to restore data or, or and, and how long does it take to do that? Um, and then lastly, how is the data archived? Where are you storing it? Online, offline, um, inside the environment, or uh, do you have another provider providing something like backup as a service? Uh, continuous monitoring is, is typically kind of that last key component there where, um, you know, we asked a moment ago and, and, and it follows up here again, centralized uh, logging, right? Are you performing centralized logging and aggregating everything into a single location and leveraging um, a security incident event monitoring tool like Splunk or something else that takes those logs, analyzes them, and then either sounds the alarm or gives you the ability to perform um, some after the fact investigation due to an incident uh, to try to figure out what's going on or what happened or some sort of root cause analysis. Um, having those centralized logs in a tool like Splunk is, is very critical to that. Um, in terms of monitoring uh, uh, anomalous conditions, um, is, is that being performed and how do folks receive the alerts? Uh, the last item here, you know, is there a security operations center, network operations center, or some sort of incident response team in place and have the protocols for something like that been defined? Whether we're talking about FISMA, FedRAMP, RMF, CMMC, um, it, it doesn't matter because the incident response requirements across each of those uh, are aligned to 853, meaning um, you've got to perform the same types of actions within each compliance uh, framework. Um, whether or not you operate to the level of a SOC NOC uh, environment is, is not necessarily a requirement, um, but incident response is. To elaborate a little bit on the FIPS 140-2, as I mentioned a moment ago, that is how uh, encryption requirements um, are assessed and satisfied within the federal government. It's required by federal law for hardware, software, on-prem and cloud-based solutions. So whether you're FISMA, RMF, FedRAMP or CMMC, this still applies. It also applies to any contractors or third parties that are connected to or operating within the environment. So meaning that when folks connect, um, whether they're there to service or they're outsourced individuals, they need to be connecting over encrypted uh, mechanisms that meet 140-2.
Um, the last item I wanted to cover here is, is, is the data sensitivity. A moment ago, I mentioned low, moderate, or high. Um, these baselines are driven by a document known as the FIPS 199. It is a risk categorization tool. Essentially, it is based on the confidentiality, the integrity or availability, otherwise known as CIA triad, uh, where you can determine whether or not you've got a limited um, adverse effect on your customer organization or even your organization's operations, assets, and individuals. A good example of a low impact environment is, is something that contains or maintains publicly releasable data where it's not a big deal if it gets compromised um, or somehow is modified, we can go back, restore it, address the issue that may have led to it being compromised in the beginning um, to a more moderate impact where you have a serious, serious adverse effect. An example of this would be unclassified national security data um, all the way to high impact where it is a severe catastrophic effect Typically, high impact systems are financial, um, they are healthcare related or um, law enforcement, right? So um, when, when looking at trying to figure out what is the risk categorization of your system, um, these are some, some very good measurements to go by. Uh, the last thing I have to add to categorization uh, before taking any questions is FISMA, you know, an attempt to meet confidentiality, integrity, and availability, um, it, it goes by the highest watermark. So you can have a low confidentiality risk and a low availability risk, but the integrity, if the integrity is a moderate, the entire system is a moderate, right? So categorization is based on the highest watermark, and that is the end for me. Thank you much, uh, Martin, for that uh, overview of what an assessment looks like. Obviously, anybody uh, looking to sell commercial cloud services to a federal agency or DOD agency needs to sort of travel this journey and understand uh, what the nuances are. I do have a question uh, for Travis that came in, um, and I'll paraphrase. Um, basically, you talked about different ATO types. Um, and so uh, essentially the question is, if I'm doing business with DOD, what is the right ATO for me? And I'm just, again, paraphrasing the yeah. question, but I think that was the intent of the question. Certainly, so um, the DOD guidance, if they're your, going to be your sponsor, your primary customer will be the DISA Cloud SRG. Uh, there is some reciprocity with the FedRAMP on the FedRAMP side. So. Uh, it doesn't have to be an either or, like if you want to pursue customers on, on both sides of that divide. Um, but but um, really the, the DOD guidance is going to be what you're going to want to focus on if the DOD is your first customer. Got it. Uh, thank you, Travis. And I apologize earlier for, uh, for getting your name wrong. So I will make sure I check myself. Uh, Martin, uh, we have a question for you. Um, how do you automate all of these processes? So um, I'll, I'll try to answer that in, in, in two parts. Uh, it, it, the things that can be automated should be automated in terms of attempting to eliminate human error and, and, and things of that nature. Um, if we are looking at a cloud deployment, for instance, and we start getting into the realm of infrastructure as a code, um, where the environment is code and that code is updated, patched, and redeployed, um, through scripted technologies, Kubernetes, containerization, um, there, there are a variety of mechanisms in, in terms of automation. Um, I, I think if, if the question is also related to things like, for instance, um, patch, uh, scan patch and remediation activities in terms of uh, the system being configured to understand and detect uh, vulnerabilities through uh, tools like, for instance, Nessus, um, grab those patches, automatically generate a ticket, push the patches out to the environment, and then close the ticket once confirmed. Um, there, are, there are a number of ways this can be done, uh, but, but from an automation perspective, um, I, I would almost say when it makes sense, where it makes sense, 
Um, but I would need probably a little more clarification on the parts that, that you'd be looking to automate. Yep, thank you, Martin. And, you know, around automation, real quick, uh, from my perspective, uh, again, you know, the pieces that Martin talked about, um, again, depending on if you're, for example, running on AWS or AWS Gov Cloud, then there are technologies available to automate the responses to some of these. And we can definitely go and have a conversation with you about that if that's of interest. But with that, uh, again, Martin, uh, I know I'm getting sort of the virtual elbow from our <laughs> webinar coordinator. So just to keep things moving along, thank you for that wonderful session. I would like to ask my colleagues from FITS to come in and talk a little bit more about uh, uh, the subsequent topics around how to best go about uh, pursuing an ATO and the different types of topics um, that come into an assessment. Certainly. All right. Thank you. So yeah, security documentation. Once you have everything architected, uh, it's time to write it all down. So getting your paperwork in order. All right. Well, often you'll come in and you've had a little bit of experience and that's great. Uh, maybe you've done a SOC 2, ISO 27001. Maybe you've uh, been fortunate enough to, to work with an agency on a FISMA, maybe an on-prem installation, and now you're interested in moving to the cloud. Um, all of that's great. You've established some formality. Um, your folks are familiar with controls. You've been in front of auditors. Um, certainly those are not prerequisites. Um, you know, you don't need to have gone through one of those to be successful, but um, you know, there are, there are things that are helpful. Um, but it's also just good to be aware and to take FedRAMP and CMMC seriously. Um, the control frameworks are much more granular. Um, you know, there's just a, a greater le level of depth and breadth to these than uh, maybe some of those other frameworks get into. Uh, much greater focus on policies, procedures, and plans, which we're gonna dig into a little bit here. And, um, you know, I, hopefully this isn't too controversial a statement, but um, in my opinion, I think they generally hold you to a much higher standard than the feds achieve for themselves. Like I said earlier, the federal government's a very large organization with uh, lots of differences, but, um, on the whole, I think that's been my experience. Um, and then something that's a little different is you have federal officials operating as regulators, which is to say they're the final decision makers about whether you get listed on the marketplace, about whether they're going to put their data into your, um, into your system, about whether the reports you're turning in are good enough, um, which is just a little bit different than SOC 2, ISO, and some of the other frameworks that are out there. So this is a big block of text and I'll say right off the bat, I don't think you should read all of it. I'm just trying to give you an idea of the scope of uh, what's out there. So required FedRAMP documents, and this is all just on the FedRAMP.gov site if you do want to uh, look this over in more detail. Um, the security plan main body, I think the template last I looked was something around 300 pages before you put any data into it. So 500 pages, 900 pages by the time you're done. It's a, it can be a big lift. Um, you know, you have your 13 security plan attachments. I have bolded a few that I believe are a little more work than the others. Um, you know, you've got your policies and procedures and that covers a lot of ground. I mean, that's one attachment and it's all security policies and all security procedures covering all, con all control families before you've got 12 more attachments left to go. So um, talking real quick about the privacy impact assessment, if you are storing or processing or the way they frame this is if you want to allow agencies to put privacy data into your system, you would fill out this privacy impact assessment um, and, and have that as part of your security package. Uh, you have your contingency plan. So this one is the one that they want in their own, their own format, the FedRAMP template. So you'll fill that out and, and uh, transfer any data you might have in your own contingency plans into that. And then configuration management plans, incident response plans, those can be in your format. So if you're um, doing things for yourselves already, just because it's the right thing to do, you can make use of that and, uh, and turn those in. But all of these attachments, and then again, um, adding the continuous monitoring plan, you know, touching back on that topic that, uh, that, that Martin discussed, you wanna have that all written down so that they can, they can uh, make sure you'll be successful at turning in those monthly reports. So, and that, that adds up to a pretty big stack of paper there. All right. Um, 
just trying to get everything I know about writing security plans into one slide real quick. You're, the whole goal of this is to tell your compliance story. So you're trying to put your best foot forward, really get credit for all of the good security work that you're doing. And so to do that, you'll need to clearly describe what the system is, the data you're processing, what the mission is, and how it basically operates, including with a number of diagrams that help you tell that story. And a key thing I can't emphasize enough is that it should be a consistent story. Use the same terms throughout this whole thousand page document. You know, if you're referring to a role or a team, keep using that term all the way through. Um, you know, set the tone for how you're going to divide your system up and talk about it in the, in the beginning. So if you've got subsystems, you know, make sure you're using consistent terminology there. And then if you'll forgive my, uh, my terrible pseudo code here, but when you're writing a control response for each part of the control, um, so you know that each control will have A, B, C, D, and then each sentence even will have, you know, maybe seven parts to each sentence. And then for each piece of the system, and what does that mean? Well, maybe you have half your systems on Windows and half is in Linux. You'll need to probably answer some things differently for those. Maybe you've got some pieces of a FISMA system that are on-premise and some pieces that are off-premise somewhere. Whatever makes sense, you need to address each piece of the system as makes sense. Then you'll need to answer the four questions. So what is the control mechanism? That can just be a simple name. But then how does that control mechanism meet this requirement? And you have to explain it. It's not self-evident necessarily. Um, and then which team or role is accountable for the control? So you don't want an individual's name. That's, you know, John Smith is too, it's too, uh, too granular, but um, just having your company name is way, you know, is not granular enough. You need to have some amount of accountability. So, you know, help desk is responsible for answering these calls or um, whatever, you know, down to that level of, uh, of responsibility. And then how often or within what time frame? you never wanna say periodically, you're, you're, this is about establishing accountability. You need to uh, commit to within an hour, we'll respond to an incident. Within you know, five seconds, we'll, we'll handle this type of alert. Um, or once a quarter, we'll review these accounts. Something like that, you've gotta really pin down a time frame. All right, so moving on here. So digging into the policies and procedures a bit. Uh, Policies establish culture. Um, they really make sure you have a management commitment and that you are, you know, you're, you're putting people in the right direction. So you're going to want to make sure that um, all of the major topics are covered, but it's okay for them to seem a little bit lived in. You know, as an auditor, we're not just looking to see that you've taken the 853 controls and you've turned those into policy or something like that. You're going to want to say, you know, these are the teams we think are responsible for this. And so we should, um, you know, here's how we, uh, here's how we handle it. Here's who's responsible. So make sure that it seems a little bit lived in, that it's tailored for your organization. Um, and then procedures, you know, telling qualified individuals. So, you know, you don't have to explain to somebody off the street how to do things, but if you hire, you know, a cloud engineer who's never worked for your company and they need to take over for someone who just left, Will they be able to read a document and understand how things are done around here specifically? You know, these are the domain controllers we point servers to. Here's how we do jump boxes to get into the system, that kind of thing. So um, do consider a mapping index at the back of your policies and procedures. So that compensates for that lived in part of things. Make sure, you know, that it just makes things easier for your auditors, you know, walking them down the garden path of like, here's what you're looking for. Here's what we think. Um, you know, meets that part of the control. So we'll move forward here. Um, why does the FedRAMP and, you know, all of its cousin uh, frameworks, why do they, why is there such a focus on the policies and procedures? Well, you know, you want to make sure there's consistent results over time. You have auditors come out, you've got your rock star engineers, they know what to do, and then those people move on, get promoted, whatever the case may be. Are the new people you bring in going to be as good at doing things as previous people were. Um, and you know, the federal government has to manage this across many, many different systems. They wanna make sure every system that they're managing internally, externally, are all meeting that minimum bar. And so policies are the foundation of a culture of security. It's making sure that security is among those top priorities for your company. And then Formal procedures get away from that tribal knowledge I was just talking about, making sure new people come up to speed faster, experienced personnel, 
can have refresher training. If you've been doing something for 10 years and you're missing a step every time, it's good to have it written down so you can get better at your job. Um, and then process deficiency, sometimes things are baked in and until you write it down and look at it, you just can't see it and, and get it fixed. So, and then when you're writing your, uh, your story in your, in your security plan, there's this idea of arcs, the controls all work together. Um, so policies and procedures lead to training. You can train people on what they ought to be doing. And then if somebody after no, some amount of training just isn't doing what they ought to be doing, it leads to personnel sanctions. You can't have people who are doing unsecure things in your system retain access. You know, there has to be some consequence at some point. So um, if you don't have policies and procedures, it's hard to get to that last step. All right. So it looks like I'm running a little ahead of schedule. So I think we have a time for maybe a question or two. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks again, Travis, for that uh, wonderful session. And, you know, I was just listening to um, all of the things that you were talking about uh, around, you know, assessing documents. And boy, uh, for every penny <laughs> uh, that I had uh, where uh, somebody comes in and says, oh, yeah, I'm just going to download those templates from the fedramp.gov website and I'm going to take a, a, a whack at writing those myself. Um, it's interesting to see how those... Uh, how those SSP projects go. So I think uh, all of the advice that you've provided is uh, worth its uh, weight in gold. Uh, we do have a couple of questions um, directly related to um, the specific uh, presentation that you made, but I think this is related to uh, some of your previous comments. So the specific question is how do concepts like IL levels, IL2, IL4, et cetera, fit in with RMF uh, and these other authorizations, um, I'm assuming that refers to FedRAMP. So yeah. where do these fall into the stack? Yeah, so Martin covered the FedRAMP side, which is, um, you know, you've got your low, moderate, high, and then you've got the DOD side. And I think the impact levels, if you go back to that uh, family tree, come from DIACAP, and they kind of move them forward into the future. Um, and so the impact levels, you know, they're, they're started off being five, and then Two of them weren't very useful, so now they effectively have about three on the unclassified side. Um, so, you know, as Martin said, there were you are looking at data sensitivity, and the mission of the system helps tell you what your, you know, the data sensitivity, low, moderate, high, IL two, IL four. Um, that's how the feds should do it for themselves. What ends up happening on the commercial side, if you're a cloud product, is that you're making more of a, again of a marketing or a business decision. So the Higher levels are more expensive, they're harder to get, there's a little more compliance risk in terms of things you could mess up and get a finding on. And so you have to make sure that there's a business case out there. So if your customer's telling you outright, I am willing to sponsor you, but you've gotta be IL-4, well, that makes your job easy. You can decide whether or not you wanna do that. If you are a little more speculative, um, you know, you might say, well, FedRAMP tailored or IL-2 is a little easier for us to get. Maybe we'll start there and, and work our way up once we have a little better idea of what our sponsors, you know, eventual federal customers might want from us. So um, there's a little bit of wiggle room there. I'll say, you know, if you are, I think a system I saw once was like a health system that was going to be sold to VA that just has all kinds of patient records. Like, look, there's just no point in you pretending like that's ever going to be bought at a FedRAMP tailored level. Like that is a high maybe you could convince somebody it's moderate, but it's definitely not a low. So there are some parameters on that, but that's how I'd make those decisions. Got it, thank you for that. Uh, with that, again, to keep the uh, session moving, I will invite our next speaker, uh, Ms. Bhumi uh, Olokoya, to talk about uh, some of the organizational requirements uh, around uh, obtaining or going for ATO accreditation uh, for a FedRAMP or DOD program. Uh, Bumi, I will ask you to take over the presentation. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Just a second while I bring up my screen. All right, there you go. Can everyone see my screen? 
You're good to go. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you're at. So I'll be talking on the organizational capabilities that you need to have in place when going for these uh, ATOs, especially the FedRAMP ATO, focusing on that. All right, so there are three different capabilities. We'll talk about the management capabilities, which focus on management of the information system and the management of the risk within that system. So talking about um, controls or capabilities like risk assessment. We'll talk about operational capabilities, which focus on mechanisms which are uh, specifically executed by people. So as opposed to systems, so we're talking about things like uh, personnel screening, which I really won't be talking about here, uh, awareness and training, configuration management, those types of capabilities. And then lastly, I'll be talking about the technical capabilities, which focus on on controls that are implemented using the system itself. So security settings within the systems that are implemented with the software or software com uh, firmware components of the system. So in terms of uh, management capabilities, one of the most, if not the most critical capability or component that you wanna make sure you have in place is a defined authorization boundary. So when we talk about the authorization boundary, we're talking about not just what's inside the boundary. So you might uh, not thinking it about it just as what it, do you have sitting in the cloud, what systems you have sitting in the cloud, but also what's outside the boundary. So really you can think about it in this way saying, where is your federal customer data? Where is it being processed? Where is it being transmitted? And where is it being stored? And a lot of times it's not just within the cloud, right? It's not just within your cloud system. So FedRAM has a guide that they put out uh, regarding authorization boundary, and these are the seven components that they identify. So first, again, uh, defining where that federal customer data is sitting, not just within your cloud systems, but where are they getting transmitted to? The second thing, it builds on the first, uh, talking about federal information data in the cloud. So when we talk about federal information or federal data, your customer data is not just that data that they're inputting into the system or that you're processing or transmitting. It also includes metadata, which is a third item. But the metadata is data associated with everything that's going on in the cloud. So think of it, uh, for instance, your log your audit logs uh, data that you're capturing from audit logs data that you're capturing from vulnerability scans those are all considered to be federal data and the reason for that is because if somebody if a bad attacker were to get a hold of the data let's assume like the vulnerability reports for instance they could identify the vulnerabilities within the system leverage that data and then you know uh, leverage that to cause an attack on the system the fourth thing is interconnections in the cloud. So if you have any systems that you're directly connected to, you also want to capture that information as part of your uh, authorization boundary, API connections, things of that nature. Moving on to five, external services in the cloud. If you're leveraging any external services in the cloud, here is where you want to capture that information. So are you, for instance, sending um, federal data or transmitting federal data to to other SaaS applications. And for five, it doesn't really specify whether it's uh, those that are have a FedRAMP authorization. Number six specifies that. So five is just if you're connecting to any external service within the cloud, you want to call that out. Definitely, if it's if it's a service that is not FedRAMP authorized, when you do go through an assessment, that will be called out as a finding. Uh, because the, there is no way of validating that they have the necessary security controls in place. And the number six is for leveraging those external services within the cloud that have a FedRAMP authorization. So those would be like the Zendesks or the Octas, um, those type of SaaS, or it could even be um, infrastructure service, so AWS and and CSPs of that nature who do have a FedRAMP authorization. 
And then the last one that FedRAM calls out is corporate services. So for those of you that may be leveraging corporate services such as your ticketing system or CRM um, systems from your corporate office, as long as it's not, it doesn't include any uh, government information, then that would not need to be identified as part of the boundary. But if it does include federal information, then that would need to be identified. So for example, one of the examples FedRAP actually gave was your email system may not necessarily be part of your authorization boundary, but then if you start to use email to send reports or information about the vulnerability scans that you're running, which does include government data, then that would bring that into scope. So again, uh, this is one of the critical steps in terms of getting ready for, you know, for an assessment. You want to make sure that you have a properly defined authorization boundary because then that helps with next steps in terms of ident identifying where you need to protect that data and then also implementing the controls regarding protecting the data. All right, so still on management capabilities. Another capability that you wanna make sure that you do have in place is that for vulnerability management and remediation. Martin mentioned this and uh, Travis also mentioned this, I believe, but there is a requirement and an expectation that as you identify vulnerabilities within your environment through the monthly scans, which that's the requirement, the monthly scans, that you're able to remedi remediate them within the identified or defined FedRAMP timeframes. So for the high, uh, those should be remediated within 30 days, for the moderate within 90 days, and lows within 180 days. So these are some of the things that you should definitely have in place. I mean, before you go, before you you become accredited, you don't necessarily need to document this with using the FedRAMP POAM template, but you should be keeping track and be able to determine and show that you're able to, um, you have a vulnerability management remediation process in place that can support these timelines. Another thing that you would need to have in place is a code vulnerability management um, process. So if you're writing custom code, you definitely want to make sure that you have a process in place to scan the code that you're, you're writing. And then if there are any vulnerabilities that are identified with that code to make sure that you have a change process in place to remediate the findings as well as a defined time frame to that you can remediate those identified vulnerabilities within the defined time frames. Moving on to the configuration settings. So this deals with system hardening um, and both, both Martin and Travis also spoke on this as well. So hardening your system and using that as a baseline to enforce security settings on your, on your servers. And there are several, there are different benchmarks out, out there. There's the CIS, which is the Center for Information Security. There's the United States Government Configuration Baseline. And then there's uh, DSA Stakes, which is a Defense Information System Agency Security Technical <laughs> Implementation Guide. So the one that you use uh, will be dependent on the ATO that you are seeking, whether if you're seeking FedRAM, then it'll be a CIS level one benchmarks that you'll be implementing. If the, it's a DOD accreditation, then uh, you would be looking at the DISA Stiggs hardening benchmarks. All right, so moving on to operational capabilities. Again, these are those that are implemented or capabilities that are executed by people. So this is not uh, a system thing, it's more uh, people executed. The first one is security awareness training. You wanna make sure that you have a program in place that is training your users. So not just as they come on board, definitely as they come on board, as well as continuous training. You wanna be training them on things such as phishing, social engineering, um, password safety, best practices, and things of that nature. The next item is staffing levels. So you wanna make sure that you have a 
uh, the right amount of resources or the appropriate amount of resources for your FedRAMP journey or whatever it is, whatever ATO journey, journey it is. Uh, Travis mentioned um, a, hmm, what was it? Okay, so, all right, scratch that. So, but as far as the staff, staffing levels is concerned, you wanna make sure that whatever staffing levels you have, it does allow for separation of duties matrix. That's what I, I was trying to say. So the separa separation of duties matrix, for instance, you don't want the same person who is approving changes to be the same person implementing changes. So as you're thinking about the appropriate staffing levels, this is something uh, to definitely keep in mind. Uh, change management, I briefly talked on that a few seconds ago, but you wanna have a change management process in place so that as you're making changes within the environment, whether it's to your code, if you do develop custom code or changes within the environment period, that you have a process in place to capture those changes, to approve those changes, and to implement those changes, and as well as be able to, you know, roll back or, or go back and do um, research or audit those changes if needed. The next item is contingency planning. So this one also, you wanna make sure that you have your contingency plan in place. If there is a, if you experience an outage, whether it's because of a breach or let's say denial of service or any type of incident, do you have the capability to recover from that? And do you have the, the capability to get back to a functional state? So you definitely wanna have this in place. You wanna have a contingency plan in place and as well as test that contingency plan or have the capability to do all that. And then the incident response is also very similar to the contingency plan. Uh, you wanna make sure that you have an incident response plan or the capability to have that in place to test that, to also not just um, test the plan, but also potentially identify if an incident is occurring in your environment. All right, moving on to technical capabilities. Uh, Martin talked about the boundary protection, but you definitely want to have boundary protection in place. You want to be able to segregate uh, one tenant from the other tenant have all the right network configuration settings in place to make sure that that boundary, you know, only allowed traffic is traversing the your boundary, whether it's internal boundaries within your tenants or external boundary from outside the internet into your environment. Uh, Martin also talked about FIPS 140-2 validated encryption, but you want to make sure that the, the encryption is in place. So whether it's for the data that's at rest, so for your backup data, your data within your, your databases, um, you definitely want to make sure that you're, you, you have that capability to encrypt it and not just encrypt, with, but with FIPS 140-2 validated encryption. Same thing for data in transit. If, as data is traversing from whether your clients into the environment or even within the environment, you, that data has to be encrypted. Um, and then also just to ensure that you're able to use TLS 1.2 or higher encryption within the environment. So um, this actually is something that we still see TLS 1.1 in use in some places and we've seen um, auditors call, call them out for, in some cases for some of our clients. All right, in terms of uh, still on technical capabilities, uh, identification and authentication, your cloud offering has to be able to support PIV authentication. And in addition to PIV authentication, you have to be able to support multi-factor authentication for your privileged users as well as non-privileged users that are access in the environment. For audit and alerting, you should be capturing all, maybe not all, but you should be capturing uh, the audit data from uh, the activities 
that are going on within your environment. FedRAP has defined what should be captured. In some cases, you may de decide to capture additional audit information. But as you capture this audit information, it's not just capturing them, but also be able to alert if there's anything that looks out of place or looks suspicious, because that could be a potential indicator that there's an incident occurring within the environment or something not just going right. For malware detection, you want to make sure that you have the capability to be um, running malware detection scans, antivirus scans within the environment to detect any malware that might be within the environment and also not just detecting, but also making sure that you have processes in place that if you do detect something, you know, what the next steps that you follow to eradicate uh, those identified malware would be. And then for incident handling and reporting. So again, going back to incident, you want to, before you can handle it, right, you will have to be able to detect it. So just making sure again that you have uh, the right alerts in place that would be a potential or that could be a potential indicator that uh, an incident is handled is being or is occurring sorry within your environment and as far as reporting is concerned FedRAMP also has guidelines for reporting but you want to make sure that that is established ahead of time if you do have an incident who do you report to how do you communicate with your customers how do you communicate with FedRAMP or whatever other agency or organization that you are required to report to. And that is the end of my presentation. So I will take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Bumi, for that. Um, so <laughs> one question uh, is you talked about separation of duties. And so one of the folks um, has a small organization of let's say 10 people. So um, they just have one IT person. So, you know, uh, again, how do we, how does a small organization handle some of these challenges, right? So maybe if you wanna just talk about, you know, it's not just multiple people, but you know, maybe there's one person who can fill in roles. And I think you and Travis sort of uh, touched on that. All right, so um, you have one person that is the IT person if so, first of all, it depends on I think what what um, ATO you're going for. If you're going for a FedRAMP moderate, for instance, uh, that is not going to go well with FedRAMP saying you have one person who is doing the the um, approval as well as doing the implementation. So within the organization, even if you don't have other people who wear that IT hat, there might be someone like the, I don't know what the other roles in your company would be, but someone else that could act as that a proven um, person or organization or board for your organization. I don't know if that was articulate enough. But yeah, uh, no, absolutely. Thank, thank you, Bumi, for that. And again, as you alluded to, um, again, you know, it's not like small organizations can't get through the process. But I think what you're saying is just think about, since you know that these are the sort of pitfalls that you're gonna encounter, uh, there are creative ways of factoring in a solution. As you said, you know, maybe somebody else can uh, play in the role of, um, you know, auditing and review. And so just don't have one person do everything. So again, Bumi, thank you so much for that session. And again, these are all the, you know, critical topics uh, that are highly relevant to an organization that is pursuing uh, an ATO and the questions sort of reflect um, uh, the, the, the content that you're sort of describing. So moving along, Bumi again, thank you. Um, moving along to our next speaker, um, it gives me great pleasure to invite um, uh, Nalini Martinez from FITS to talk about organizational commitment. Um, and that's an incredibly important topic. I mean, I can't tell you how many people uh, that at least we encounter, they feel like, oh, <laughs> FedRAMP is just like any other uh, audit program that they can just, uh, you know, maybe hire a few people and spend some money and get it done. So it's a little bit more than that. But 
uh, I don't want to steal Nalini's thunder and I uh, want to go ahead and invite my next co-speaker. Nalini, over to you. One of the things I was trying to think of is how can I use the minimum amount of acronyms? And I was wondering, should we convert it into a drinking game? But I think it's too early in the day. It's kind of crazy how many acronyms we use. So for those of you who are not familiar, I apologize on behalf of everybody. Um, but yeah, to, to speak to what GP said, you know, I'm in sales and BD and I've been kind of in this cybersecurity space for some years now. And my role has always been kind of that first line of defense when someone calls to find out about whether it's CMMC, FedRAMP, or just, hey, we want to sell into the federal space and, and what do I need to know? Um, and, and there are a couple of gates that I mentally check off uh, in my head. And one of the biggest ones is what kind of um, buy-in do we have from the entire organization, especially top down? Um, Travis, you can go to the next slide, please. So, um, you know, this is just, I would call it common sense really, but it's really important to think on these things and kind of make sure we account for them kind of early on uh, in the process. So whether the idea of trying to get an ATO, it doesn't matter what kind, comes up for you. It could have been init initiated perhaps from your sales team, right? So you're, there's someone, say you have a commercial environment and there's someone on the sales team who's like, why don't we sell into the federal space? And then someone starts digging into it and sees that you need some kind of ATO. Or perhaps you have an on-prem solution and you're thinking about, well, everybody's talking about this cloud first thing for the past 10 years, maybe we should finally do it. Or your customers are demanding it, right? Uh, and then you're starting to think about FedRAMP. And of course, you may not have a choice uh, in the case of, for example, CMMC. If you're dealing with the DOD, you're going to have to start thinking about CMMC and how to achieve that at some point. It doesn't matter where it starts out from and which group within the organization brings the requirement. At the end of the day, you need to have your leadership buy into it. So let's talk about why and why that's important. We all know that this is an expensive process. I don't think that's a secret. Um, I, I know it's a, an area of much you know, worry, consternation. Um, why should we have such high costs? But the, uh, uh, everyone's trying to get it down, right? Automation, um, things like what Stack Armor is doing there, we're trying to bring the cost down to, to uh, the road to the ATO. But at the end of the day, yes, it costs a lot of money, but at the same time, there's high reward or you wouldn't be interested in this topic. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about ROI and how to, you know, how to approach that question because without ROI, you may as well just walk away from this whole, uh, you know, this whole project. But the cost is high and that's another reason you need the board or leadership C-suite, everyone to be very much plugged into why are you doing this uh, and having the buy-in from them. Um, the second thing is it, it takes a long time from the day you decide or even from the days you're investigating, is this something I want to do and my organization should be doing until actually starting the process, then getting your ATO, and then maintaining your ATO. It's one of those lifelong things. It's like you have to do it forever. So um, if you have someone with a short attention span sitting in your boardroom or, or whoever's the executive sponsor of this project, it's not going to work, right? You need someone to know that this is something that you are going to have to approach together as an organization. You may have to make changes within your organization, hire more people. Uh, there's going to be some outlay in terms of time and money, and it's going to take a long time, right? Um, and then the next thing is coordinating the many teams. Uh, after hearing Bunmi talk, it must be evidently clear to everybody that this is not a one-man job. It's not a ten-man job. It could it, it affects and impacts all the various teams within the organization, and if leadership isn't, you know, kind of pushing or hasn't built that story within the organization that this ATO and this process is very important to you, you may have teams that are like, "Don't come to us for this. We have no time for this. We're not interested." You know, move along. Uh, but if your leadership believes strongly that this is the right thing for you to do, then all the teams will understand, kind of fall in line and give the team going after the ATO the support that they need to actually get there. 
And then the next thing is consistency. Um, you know, if um, the, it, as you go through this process, you're going to be touching so many different folks outside of your organization as well, right? Whether it's your agency, if you're doing FedRAMP, it may be the PMO, it may be agency representatives. Uh, if you're doing CMMC, it might be the CMMC authorization board. You have to have that confidence as an organization. And when you're talking to the agency or all the other external stakeholders, if they see the management buy-in, it builds confidence uh, within these external companies or participants that yes this organization knows what they're doing um, and you know helps you along in that process um can you go to the next slide travis please okay so let's talk a little bit about roi um it's very easy a lot of people just think well what is how much income am i going to make and how much am I going to spend? And that's my ROI. But there are other things to consider. And a lot of folks come to me saying, can you help me build out this ROI? Because I want to be in this space, uh, but I'm not sure if the amount of money I'm going to spend is going to be, you know, it's going to come back to me in some way. Um, and there are some very easy ones, right? Once I had a prospect saying, well, this is a $400 per year gig like should i go after fed rounds and that's a very clear answer but there are some others that may not be as clear um so definitely try to see what could you bid on right you can go to these websites that tell you what rfps rfis rfqs are out there scrape them see what's happening can you bid on them how much would you make year after year um are you the first to the space you may have a bunch of competitors but if you beat them to having an ato um, you may have an edge and you may be able to corner the market. So it may al almost be an investment at that point with the hopes of kind of cornering the market. And if you're not the first to the space, well, what is your competitor who's already been there doing and how much money have they made off of it? Uh, and is, do you, does it make sense for me? And, you know, don't stop when you're talking about investment, don't stop at, hey, I've got, gotten an ATO, my investment in terms of money and time is over, because as we've heard from everybody else, there is a component of continuous monitoring, there are sometimes annual assessments that have to be done, and there's certainly continuous monitoring requirements, which neatly falls into the next bullet point there for out years, right? So who's going to maintain that? Do I need more people in my organization to maintain my conmon? Or should I just hire a third party who kind of does this day in and day out? It may be easier, cheaper for me to outsource some of my conmon work as opposed to taking it in house. Or you may feel like I definitely want to keep this closer to me and maybe I want to have the um, you know the power over my poems and the story that I'm telling. All of these are decisions that have to be made, not just for the here and now, but for the out years as well. Um, and that kind of goes to the initial and ongoing costs. Um, you, you know, sometimes I say initially, if you, you're looking for an advisor, someone to help you kind of figure out if your environment uh, needs to be remediated, and if so, how to get to your ATO phase. Um, sometimes it's good to hire an outside company, right? Somebody who already has experience and knowledge may take them a month or two or three or four to help you out. Uh, but then you're done as opposed to maybe looking for and hiring people who you now have on a salaried basis for many, many years. Um, and by the way, best of luck trying to find someone in this space who's good, right? All of us are looking for people in this space who are good. Um, very difficult to find people. Um, so yeah, so to think about whether you want to outsource it or keep that effort in-house. Um, can you go on to the next slide, Travis? So there are lots of folks involved, right? As we've mentioned, you have your management, you have sales, you have compliance folks, engineers, ops folks, developers. It even goes down to HR, training, legal. So it's, an, it's, it's something that comes as a surprise to folks who are first getting into the space. But as you start digging into the requirements and especially all of those policies and procedures that Travis talked about, you'll see that there are a number of different um, teams and folks that are involved in making sure that this is gonna happen. And let's go to the last slide. Um, talking about the three types of ATOs um, that we had discussed earlier, who should I be working with? Again, doing some of the work in-house 
absolutely works. In fact, it's recommended so that you have a team internally that knows what the compliance requirements are, what the security requirements are. But at some point, you're going to have to get some outside help, at the very least for your audits, right? So you're going to need someone to do an actual audit for you. And in the case of some of these compliances, you actually have to have an accredited third party to do it. Um, so you have to go to a particular list, find someone off of that list, and they would do your audit for you. Um, and again, you could get folks who could help you get there, external folks, or you can hire or build that capability internally, but you need, you're going to need some kind of outside help as you go through this process. Um, I'm going to stop here because I want to try and catch us up on our time. I'm happy to take a question or two around uh, kind of the teams and what kind of internal organization and buy-in you need. Nalini, wow. Thank you. Thank you so, for, so much for that session. And, you know, again, um, definitely, I think the, the, the key parts, or at least the ones that I took away from your presentation, is it's certainly not uh, for the faint of heart, right? If you're going into this, go into it uh, with the right resolve and the right reasons. And yes, you know, there is a certain amount of commitment that is required from the organization. So I think um, the message that you relayed there uh, was uh, extremely, I think, important for folks on this call interested in looking at, um, you know, the FedRAMP marketplace to sort of uh, imbibe. Um, I don't have any questions per se to uh, the areas, uh, Nalini, that you covered, but I will um, sort of uh, throw out a question to our um, amazing panel. Um, if you're in a commercial organization and work, will be working with CUI, on federal projects in AWS, will the organization require a FedRAMP ATO or will implementing FedRAMP certified solutions uh, with FIPS encryption be sufficient? So I open it to the panel. Um, Happy to Melanie, tackle that one. Sure. Travis. So, um, you know, there, the, uh, when you think about the cloud, you've got the whole stack, you've got the infrastructure, the platform, and the software as a service. Um, generally, if you are going to be a customer on a software as a service that has received its FedRAMP certification, um, so maybe we're all familiar with uh, O365 from Microsoft. Um, you know, if you're in their FedRAMP certified environment, then you don't really have any other responsibility as far as getting your own ATO. Whereas maybe in this case, it's kind of implying to me that maybe you want to get Amazon as an infrastructure or platform as a service and then put your own software on top of that. Um, your software, your element of that that you're layering on top of the IaaS or the PaaS will need to be, uh, need to go through a FedRAMP ATO would be my take on it. That's maybe some complexity around the edges, but as the, the simple answer is that. Sounds great. Thank you for that. Um, moving along, uh, obviously we are around organizational preparedness, commitment, uh, and the next step is obviously uh, there are certain things that are uh, expected to be in place. So I will ask my colleague uh, Martin to talk a little bit about the specifics of maturity and the evidence around maturity that you might go in and expect to be questioned on as you go through a FedRAMP accreditation process. Martin? Thanks, GP. Uh, hopefully everyone can see the screen. So we're going to jump in and talk about um, the, the, the final piece here in, in terms of uh, sections and preparing for an ATO. And, and that's really um, centered around an organization's maturity. Um, this is broken up really into three key areas, which is system management and personnel staffing. Um, the system development lifecycle and, and kind of synonymously also for those that are providing uh, software, uh, the software development lifecycle and the change management activities that go with that. And then a little bit on the technology, which you, you may have noticed throughout the day that, that we have uh, been, been very, very heavy on the, on the technology piece. So an organization's maturity, you know, is, is based on um, a few key things, uh, readiness and capability that is ultimately expressed 
through its people, processes, um, and technologies. And I mean, in, in the traditional sense, for those out there, people, process, technology, um, these are things that we hear all the time, but as, as Nalini mentioned, um, the consistency of the practices and, and, and the things that are in place uh, are, are critical and in, in very, very uh, high in, in considering an organization's maturity levels. So let's go ahead and dig in. Um, so from a staffing level, you know, there was a question a moment ago. Um, hey, we're, we've only got 10 folks and, you know, only one of them's dealing with IT. Um, I, I didn't necessarily want to jump in too much earlier because we were going to talk about it a bit here. But, but the key here um, is, is do you have the adequate level of, of personnel with the right skills, the right qualifications and experience and knowledge um, to secure the environment, right? Uh, additionally, you know, of those people who are working on the system, you know, when it comes to things like separation of duties or roles and responsibilities, you know, being able to clearly define those roles and how many of those individuals um, being one deep is a red flag, right? In terms of maybe only have one software developer, right? Um, that type of situation can sometimes be offset through code escrows and uh, depending on the complexity there, but uh, it, it's definitely a red flag. It's a huge risk. Um, and it's not uncommon to see organizations that have three to five people who have just built an incredible product that, like Melanie said, they they want to go um, and and sell this product to the government, and, and in many cases, it's extremely valuable and would be you know gobbled right up by the government. And, and we see this happen all the time. However, um, we also see deficiencies uh, where the types of security people we normally see in place in terms of information system security officers or ISSOs. Uh, an ISSM would be your information security manager. In most cases, there are typically those two folks kind of leading the security charge for a company um, with the support of someone like a, like a chief information security officer or a chief information officer. But as I mentioned, in some small organizations, those C-suite roles may not exist. The ISSM and ISSO role may not exist. Um, which kind of falls down to what I would say is the bare minimum where you've got security analysts, security engineers, uh, and folks who for all intents and purposes are performing privileged activities, meaning they can apply patches, they can make configuration changes, they have authority to make compliance related decisions. So as that middle bullet states, um, defining those roles, how many people are who's filling those roles, and then understanding uh, whether or not they're full-time or dedicated. I is this a collateral duty? And in many cases, um, whether it's FISMA, FedRAMP, or RMF, sometimes these things are treated as collateral duties. However, maintaining um, a authority to operate is a continuous ongoing process with daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and annual requirements that come with it. So the people that are performing those ongoing uh, continuous monitoring, in other words, after you get the ATO type activities uh, are critical. And, and, and as the last bullet states, you know, who has the authority to perform privileged activities? That is, is from your auditor is gonna be one of your number one questions um, in terms of you know, like I said before, those folks who are applying patches, making configuration changes, compliance related decisions, um, all of it matters. So having the right people in the right place with the right skills uh, is, is to me one of the biggest, biggest uh, key items that you have to have. Um, digging into the SDLC uh, and change management, right? Are, are you leveraging something like a, a ticketing system to manage and track change requests? Do, do you have uh, a change control board or something like a change advisory board, right? Um, in terms of whether or not you have a development or test environment, 
um, and whether or not you are verifying changes before you implement or push to production um, are, are, are very, very, very critical to the support of FISMA, FedRAMP, RMF, and even CMMC in some cases where these change management capabilities, um, specifically how you go about doing them, the requirements are, are really that you have some sort of formal process, but from a maturity standpoint, having uh, a, a change management process that is mature both in its capability to not only influence changes in the system, but whether or not the change is gonna introduce risk, is it gonna increase the level of security or reduce the level of security? These are all things that a CCB or a CAB being that change advisory board um, would help support and deliver as a team to make sure you know everything is, uh, for lack of better terms, on the up and up. Uh, making sure that we're not just looking at, for instance, one vendor. We're looking at multiple best of breed. Um, what are the additional security risks that adding a new component may bring, such as ports, protocols, and services? Um, is an external vendor to the environment, maybe they're not fed ramped, which is something that you can't have uh, an interconnection between a fed ramp system and a non fed ramp system, for example. Um, both environments would need to be authorized to the same level. Um, kind of rounding this out from a technology perspective, as I, I sort of just dipped into this, but are there dependencies on other vendors, right? Um, such as, you know, as I state here, leverage service offering, um, hypervisors, operating system patches, things like physical security, software and hardware. Uh, in many cases, you can think of that infrastructure as a service support that Amazon and or Azure or uh, who, whatever other FedRAMP infrastructure may provide to you. Um, those types of dependencies in many cases can be inherited or shared uh, but when it's external to the environment, it's outside the boundary or crossing the boundary. Um, as I said before, they've, they've got to be at the same level. So a moderate connecting to a moderate, uh, whether you're storing, processing, or transmitting data, it all matters. Um, within the system, uh, are, are all of the products or components that you're using um, supported by their vendors? So an example could be maybe you're using Box, Okta, Slack, um, Duo, Smartsheet, etc., cetera, or, or Red Hat along with Trend Micro and other key things. Um, are those vendors uh, able to provide support or are you leveraging something more that's open source where you have to go to the community um, and, and try to get help there? So uh, having uh, service level agreements uh, and things like that in place are also very critical. Um, lastly, you know, from a maintenance perspective, uh, having formal agreements, especially as a CSP or a cloud service provider, um, as Nalini said, we threw a lot of acronyms at you today. So <laughs> um, while there, there is a certain expectation with, with going after an ATO, uh, as, a, as a cloud service provider, um, when you are engaging other vendors, for the purpose of developing or establishing your cloud service offering, um, having those formal agreements for continuous ongoing maintenance, licensing, uh, and support is a auditable item. Um, it's something that would need to be presented. When those things don't exist, uh, they can become a finding and sometimes a high finding. So uh, it's very important to have those agreements in place. Um, with that, I will go ahead and stop for a moment, see if there's any questions, and return it to GP. Uh, thank you, Martin, uh, for that uh, question. Uh, sorry, the opportunity to ask you some questions. So I'm just looking at the Q&A panel. I think um, uh, folks are still digesting a lot of this uh, amazing content that you shared uh, and uh, also the previous panelists shared. So. Um, I guess, uh, Martin, just uh, one of the questions that keeps to um, keep coming up 
is you know around uh, the types of uh, organizational elements that need to be in place to be able to go in and achieve you know the level of commitment and maturity that you're describing so in other words you know just as a case in point and as you saw there were some questions around that is there a particular size expectation in terms of uh, you know what an organization should be at to be able to pursue this realistically? Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give my two cents and then, then maybe open it up to the rest of the panel, but here's what I would say. Um, regardless of the size of the organization, the question that, that I've received the most over the last nine to 10 years um, in doing this is, is what type of resources do I need? Do, do I need to hire people? How many people are involved? You know, and, and I look at it from, from two perspectives. I, I look at it in, in the preparation phase of preparing for an ATO. And then I look at it from the post ATO. Uh, when preparing, you, you need somebody to act as a project manager on the cloud service provider side of the fence. Okay. Um, that's somebody in your organization who's going to herd the cats, help with the scheduling, make sure people are responding uh, to documentation reviews, control statements, questions, and, and the overall design or modification of the environment if any of that's necessary. Um, so that's kind of person number one of five. Uh, the next two are, are people that I described in the beginning, which is an ISSO and an ISSM. Um, not everybody can afford both or has both. Uh, in most cases, an ISSM can perform, that, that manager can perform those ISSO type duties and in, in smaller organizations that does happen. Um, and there's, there's not necessarily anything wrong with it. It's just, a, it's a lot of work. <laughs> so you are, you are putting a lot on one person. Um, but in, in those smaller shops, uh, depending on the size and scope of the environment, it may not be that big of an ask. The, the next or last two people is security analyst, security engineer, okay? Um, those two people with, with the analyst performing more of the kind of day-to-day -day, uh, or daily, weekly, kind of monthly activities in terms of log reviews, uh, internal audits, um, making sure patch scan remediation is happening and then generating monthly reports and maintaining what's called a plan of action and milestones. Uh, in conjunction with the security engineer who, from an architecture and engineering standpoint internally, is making sure that new modifications to the systems, configurations, um, all of the technology pieces uh, are, are maintaining compliance. Um, those five people, critical to the maintenance and operation of the environment, uh, don't necessarily need to be fully in place prior to an ATO. But I would say eight to 12 weeks out, yes. Um, as far as post ATO, uh, the minimum there would be analysts and someone acting as an ISSM uh, with the understanding the rest of the team, your cloud architects, software developers, engineers, um, and your organizational support is there. So that, that would really be my answer to the minimum number of folks you would need. You, you can get away with three, but you really need about five folks. Thank you much, Martin. So um, again, I'm getting the virtual elbow here to keep mo moving <laughs> and <laughs> stay within the time. And I'm sure we can continue to talk uh, about these interesting topics, uh, you know, uh, uh, at length. But just in terms of uh, quickly wrapping up the show today, it's uh, just amazing how quickly time flies, especially when you're among friends and having a good time. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank my uh, colleagues from FITS, um, Melanie and Travis, uh, for being on the call today with us and helping answer all of these incredible uh, questions and helping folks uh, better understand the landscape. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Martin, yourself, and Bumi for putting together the content. I know it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of effort uh, to put something like, together, uh, like this together. So with that, um, we will rapidly close today's session, but uh, we do have a special offer for those of the organizations that are pursuing a FedRAMP ATO. 
um, if you go in and send us an email using this code, uh, we are offering a $10,000 credit towards a FedRAMP uh, ATO uh, accelerator assessment. Um, and the idea behind that is to help organizations that are genuinely interested in uh, FedRAMP to go in and come to us and let us help them figure out some of these challenges where again, we bring to bear some of our relationships uh, with folks like um, C3POs, like Fitz um, at, uh, and uh, Nalini and Travis. Again, our goal is to try and make you successful, um, especially if you are hosted on AWS or AWS Gov Cloud. So again, please shoot us an email and uh, let us know if this is an offer you would like to take us up on. And with that, we are towards the end of um, this uh, broadcast. And we, again, appreciate you tuning in, asking us all of these questions. And again, please stay tuned on the content and uh, slides and video recordings and all of that fun stuff. I know there are a lot of questions on that. We will post that information and the latest updates on our blog page. With that, this is GP from Stack Armor signing off and wishing all of you a wonderful afternoon.